can go. Hi, everyone. Can you hear us all right? Hey, thank, thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a real pleasure for us to have this uh, kind of interaction. Um, we are fortunate to have Dr. John uh, Jan Basil, who is a professor of medicine at MUSC. Dr. Basil has a distinguished education and background. He's a, a graduate of Johns Hopkins, where he got his undergraduate degree, and then he did his medical training and MD degree at a medical college of Virginia, then went to MUSC, where he had uh, is been there for a number of years, rising from his internship, his residency, his chief residency, all the way up through a professorship. Uh, he is known throughout the world for his expertise in hypertension. Uh, he is uh, knowledgeable about the clinical syndrome, knowledgeable about the etiology, the public health implications. He's been recognized broadly as a master teacher, educator, and great speaker. So we are really fortunate to have him here to talk to us today about that subject and get your input and your thoughts and, and questions. So welcome, Dr. Basil. Well, thank you, Dean Reed. That was very nice. Um, so we're going to make this very informal. Um, if you all have questions uh, you'd like to ask, um, you know, tell me a little bit about your situation and um, how you um, see patients and where they're coming from and their demography and, and some of the challenges you have uh, in your healthcare system. So we have to, you have to unmute over there, I think. Oh, yeah, I want to hear from you. Thanks. Hey there. Allow us to make some introductions. This is Judith Hunt. This is Dr. Hunt from Payson. And she is one of our co-directors of our rural health uh, division and also the one of the directors of the LIC. Dr. Hunt, would you mind introducing some of the fine group you have around you? I sure do. Um, the first one I'm going to introduce is Dr. Washatka. She's one of our senior mm -hmm. residents with MedPeds. She's going to graduate from the program. So she started with us uh, almost seven, well, seven, almost eight years ago. So we're excited to actually, Dean Reed, to have one that's finally has gone through um, the training up here. Very and impressive. Russ, go ahead. I say very impressive. Yeah. yeah. And so we have paper galaxy students raise your hands. Mm -hmm. so, so, <laughs> Say it so again, again, Judy. These are the, the longitudinal here. They um these are the longitudinal students, and they're the ones that are up here for almost nine months. They do their entire clinical year up here with us, um, except for neurology. And um, and so they um, we do uh, they do a longitudinal experience. So they're um, all throughout the, the rural community doing their training with um, community physicians and, and faculty. And so you guys raise your hands again. <laughs> that's impressive. Great so to see you guys. That's yep. from, they're from this medical school. Yes, it's from University of Arizona, Phoenix. We do have one special one. <laughs> He's from Tucson. Okay, and, and you all house them for nine months? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And feed them. Actually, the feeding is the worst, hardest challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all the time. Yes, we, um, we feed them. And then there are a yeah. couple on the right side near you that you haven't introduced. Okay. Um, this is um, Max. Max is um, uh, one of our students from, he's a PA student from Marquette University. Okay. And uh, Sarah, all the way over here. <laughs> Come in a little bit more. <laughs> Come on, Sarah. A, she's a nurse, pra nurse practitioner student um, okay. here for a year from NAU. Okay. She's up here for the full year. He's here for four months. Great. The shortest. And then Eric, raise your hand. <laughs> Eric is actually one of our nurse prac students who graduated and we hired. 
Okay, yeah. very good. In fact, the, the neatest thing, Dean Reed, he's from Payson. Even more golden. <laughs> so we grew one of our own. That's incredible, great. Yeah. How, many, how many people are in the communities you serve? We have a draw of 30,000, but there's 15,000 in this community directly. And that they're, they're unique patients in your healthcare system? There's in, in our community, there's 15,000 that live in Payson itself. It's an island in the National Forest. Um, and so we really don't have anything for about an hour and 20 minutes, no matter which way we go. Where's the nearest hospital? We are at the nearest hospital. And the okay. next one is, is an hour and 20 minutes away. And you're 24 7 with an ER? Yes, we are. Oh, wow. Okay. What's the mean income? of a family in your town i wish i could i could tell you we have um give me one second <laughs> no yeah it's, a billionaire. it's a it's about fifty five thousand. though there are some outliers because there are some extraordinarily wealthy people that live in Payson. okay Hobbit. okay very good are they friends okay okay and what percent of those people do you think have hypertension well we have about 60 percent of our population Proper is over um, the age of 65. Um, so um, proper. This is also a, a community that people travel through and they're here in the summer and not here in the winter. But oh. if we were to take a core, it's about 60% um, that are over the age of 65. So hypertension is a huge thing that we talk about every day. They're here in the summer when it's hot rather than the winter when it's beautiful. Uh, no, because cool oh, you're what? cooler than Phoenix. Yes. Oh, what's your temperature now? Temperature. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And now it's probably about seventy. It's seventy-five degrees right now. Oh okay. my goodness. Okay, we're gonna come over there. <laughs> okay, so real quickly, uh, I'll just start it off. So there are a lot of challenges to treating patients with hypertension. I'm glad that you have a mean income that's reasonably you know above poverty for sure um, i'm hoping that most people in your community and you can tell me can get longitudinal care with a practitioner that's not true what percent of adults in your community do you think know who their primary care clinician might be 50% at a top. Yeah. And I think that $55,000, I don't know where Colton got that from. I pulled it from Google again. I think there are some serious outliers there too. I don't think that Google okay. is correct. Okay, we so are, we're, we're a HIPSA score that's about 18. Yeah. We have a primary care shortage. Um, we have a great population um, that are seen at the emergency department and urgent care with no follow up because they can't get into a primary care physician but you have clinicians there can't they from the your er be scheduled to someone there they try it's the amount of of openings the all of our practices are absolutely swamped with patients okay so let me tell you um the control of blood pressure and i don't know if you're shooting for 130 over 80 which is the most recent recommendation on the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, or 140 over 90, which is still accepted as a target by the American Academy of Family Physicians and the American College of Physicians, family physicians and internists. Um, I personally would rather see blood pressure closer to 130 than 140. I think the, the data and the, and the outcomes are better. And I do think that 130 is less than 140. So there's no reason to fight about that. I'm not as concerned with the lower number in the older person. The peds doc there, we really respect diastolic hypertension in young people, in children and adolescents, but we don't really care as much with diastolic. It's very rare. Diastolic elevation is responsible for 4% of cardiovascular events. Systolic, 96%. So if you get that systolic control, the diastolic usually is going to be controlled. 
how over the last three, four, five years, blood pressure control has gotten worse. And when we look at why that is, it's because patients don't have longitudinal follow-up. Those that are seen at least once a year are more likely to be controlled than those that aren't. They don't identify with who their primary care clinician is. They don't have whole blood pressure cuffs to check their blood pressure. We'll talk about that in a minute. They can't afford their medicine, which a lot of our medicine now is very inexpensive. And those are the major, those are the major issues why we haven't done as well as we could be doing. So the fact that you don't have people identifying with a clinician um, is, is a challenge. What percent of your people with hypertension do you think have home blood pressure cuffs? Honestly, I would say probably about 30%. Okay. It's very unfortunate. Um, we have a clinic up here that's a mercy care clinic. And actually our patients there probably have more access to blood pressure cuffs because we give them away and we work the students work with them to get their cuffs. But as a community at large, um, most patients do not have blood pressure cuffs. Okay, so that's a real issue because we are now, we know that outcomes, cardiovascular outcomes, stroke, kidney disease, much more correlated with home blood pressure than office blood pressure. In fact, in our recent guideline, we're urging people, clinicians, to make determinations on initiating an uptight trading medication, for the most part, based on home pressures, more than the office. In fact, we say the office is used for screening, and the home blood pressures confirm the diagnosis. And that's because if you're only using the office, you're going to misclassify the 30% of people that have a white coat hypertension. They could be elevated in the office, have no target organ disease, and they're actually okay at home. They're normal at home. And yet you've called them hypertensive. So you need to get home blood pressure measurement on all your patients. And, you're, and, and that's a challenge. Well, it's unfortunate. And what percent of your patients, if they're 65 and older, are on Medicare? I mean, probably 95% of them. Okay. It's, a, it, it's terrible that Medicare will not provide a blood pressure cuff. You know, it, it's really an issue, and we've been fighting with them. But I'll tell you what they do do now. If you teach a patient how to take their blood pressure, at home, teach them in the office, they will pay you $11 for that ICD-10 code. I think it's 99473. And if you teach them how to take their blood pressure at home, 99474, and capture their blood pressure at home, and send you the results, They'll pay you for making determinations without even having to see the patient. You can do it virtually. It doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. So this is great for you because you're telling me you don't have enough visits to fill up. So you need to have virtual visits and you need to have, so you can look at their blood pressures and then call them and bill them. Have a conversation. So that's going to help. That's huge. What do you guys think? I like $11. That's huge. So here's how you do the home blood pressure. You tell them to take, when they first wake up, seated like I am, in a chair, back supported, feet on the ground, empty your bladder. In fact, you can go to the website, Target BP. One word. It's an AMA, AHA website, and they have a beautiful blue picture, single page that you can Xerox, download Xerox, and give to every patient. It tells them how to prepare themselves, how to, how to take their pressure appropriately. 
for instance, when they come into your office, there should be, they should, they should have emptied their bladder, not smoked or drank for 30 minutes. And that would be mostly smoking, exercise, and they shouldn't have any conversation with any medical assistant or nurse that's trying to find out their pain score, their medication reconciliation while they're pumping up the cuff. That'll elevate their systolic 20 millimeters. No engagement, no, no conversation. And let me ask you, are you using automated devices? You're using sigma manometers and stethoscope. Yes. That's fine for the pediatrician, but you shouldn't be doing that in 2022. We're now recommending automated oscillometric devices so that we don't care about your hearing. We don't care about the deflation speed or the obliteration pressure. You just put the right size cuff, which you measure their mid arm circumference, put on the cuff and press a button. It allows five minutes of waiting before the first pressure is taken. And it'll take three successive pressures a minute apart and you can hide the blood pressure. So if they peak, they won't get frightened by their first measurement. So I urge you, if you can get the money together to get automated oscillometric devices and you, they're on wheels and you just wheel them from room to room. This idea of taking pressures with people on a table with their feet dangling with the sigma manometer on the wall is not acceptable anymore. That all elevates their pressure, the dangling of the feet, the clothes on the arm, the cell phone that they're talking to someone on or waiting for a call. That all has to stop. It's seated, rested, just go to target BP. So that's, that's important. At home, the blood pressure can be taken with one of these devices that you can get in. And I don't know if you have it there, but let's just say Costco, Sam's, whatever you have, CVS, you know, all those drugstores. And if you can get them a device and you can go to um, the, the website is, I think it's accuratebloodpressure.com. And it will tell you the best devices, but most of them are okay. Any device is better than none. When they get up, seated, back supported, they take two blood pressures. After they first get up, empty their bladder, take those pressures, record them. And then at night, right before they go to bed, take two more pressures. And then for one week, you'll have 28 pressures. Two in the morning, two in the evening for seven days. They don't have to take and they shouldn't take their pressure every day. They'll get very anxious. So one week of the month, we throw out the first day because they're performing that day. That's their first day of the week. And we look at the next 24 values. You put those values that they'll tell you into your computer and you make a determination on what you're going to do. And then you put in 99474 and you get $15 for the visit from Medicare. So you have your people there check all this to make sure that that's right. So this is a way using own blood pressures, patients engaged in their own blood pressure measurement, people that check their own blood pressure are more likely to take their medicine and to be controlled, and the cost overall is less than if they don't take their blood pressure. And there's a paper in the journal Circulation, just Google it with my name on it, 2020, and it's a white paper on home blood pressure measurement. Talks all about how to do it, why to do it, what it means, and the cost savings, all referenced in the journal Circulation, 2020. And um, so that's a whole new way. I mean, a lot of people are not doing this. So this may be new to you. It doesn't surprise me. 
But telemed isn't new to us because we've been doing telemed for years because of our rural nature. Um, and but the the way that you're asking us to have the patients measured, that that's new, that's revolutionary. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah. That's that's good. Um, one of these students have been doing telemedicine since they've been up here. Telemedicine is great. I don't have any problem with face-to-face -face telemedicine, but it can also be telephone. Right. And you document that and you put that in your note. But so so that's very helpful for blood pressure control in the rural setting. Lifestyle modification is very important, regardless of your blood pressure. It's good for all of us. I mean, we're going out for dinner tonight. And I don't want to put a squash on what everyone's going to get, but we're we're jogging over there. We're jogging over. Yeah, that's yes. good. I like that. But you know, there's a lot going on with weight. So you know, you just look at here's the here's what I say. So in 1969, I was fortunate or unfortunate to actually travel to Woodstock. <laughs> and I can tell you, when you go on and Google Woodstock, you don't see one overweight person in that crowd of 500,000 people. They're young, 18 to maybe 30. They're thin. If we had Woodstock today, what would that look like? So, being overweight and obese, 70% of American adults, that's not helping blood pressure. Anything we can do to work with patients to get their weight down is helpful. For every pound that they lose, regardless of how they do it, their systolic goes down a half a millimeter mercury. So we say for every kilogram, it goes down one millimeter systolic. Exercise, any type. We used to just say aerobic. Now it can be any type of exercise, including uh, resistance training exercise. Uh, the more 150 minutes a week, the better. The more strenuous, the better. Swimming's better than walking, but walking's good. Um, sodium and potassium. So sodium especially in the elderly, the African-American, the obese, leads to higher blood pressures through salt and water retention. We'd like, most of the salt we get in our diets are from canned foods, frozen foods, and processed foods. The salt shaker is not as much a problem with us as it is with Asian and, and South Asian cultures. So patients have to read the labels. And we want less salt and more potassium in the diet. Now, how do you get potassium? Fruits, vegetables, fish. And, and that's a problem because a lot of people have food insecurity, food poverty. You know, if people in your community have housing insecurity, it's very hard to control blood pressure when they don't have a roof over their head. So social determinants of health are very important in the control of blood pressure. And we need to know if the people we're taking care of can, do they have a roof over their head? You know, do, are they challenged by some of these things? And if necessary, a social worker can be very helpful. Okay, so high foods rich in potassium, low in sodium. We're trying to get an inverted sodium potassium ratio in the urine. If we do that, there's less cardiovascular events. And that's new. We used to always focus just on sodium. Now we're trying to get more potassium and less sodium in our diet. And KCL tablets won't work. It has to be food. We don't want to do this in people with chronic kidney disease or hyperkalemia or potassium is greater than 4.5, 4 or a GFR less than 30, because they'll get into trouble with a high potassium diet. But the others, it would be great. Alcohol. 
I mean, I'm sure, you know, people are drinking alcohol and that's not good in hypertension. So we say, what's a drink? Five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer. And depending on your liquor, if you're drinking wild turkey, which is about 100% proof, it's one ounce. And if you're drinking a gin that's 70 proof, it's 1.5 ounces. But we let women have one of those and men two of those, and that's all. And that's because women have less alcohol dehydrogenase in their gut, so they don't metabolize alcohol like a man does. We're not picking on women, you know, uh, to lessen their alcohol. And alcohol is a problem. I mean, I've had patients and their spouses telling me what they do, and they have a cocktail at lunch, a highball at four o'clock, wine at dinner, another cocktail at nine. I mean, I'm trying to control their blood pressure and that's not helpful. So weight, exercise, no alcohol or less alcohol, a little alcohol is probably good, but that's a tough sell because you tell people alcohol is a cardioprotective and they're drinking a lot more than you want them to. So that's a challenge. And um, less sodium and more potassium. And that's the lifestyle, if you can get that. And all Americans should, be, should, should adopt that, but especially the hypertensives. And then the drugs, three classes as the first three classes. Thiazide diuretics, calcium channel blockers, and an ACE or an ARB, but not both. Now, with the thiazides, we like chlorothalidone because it's evidence-based. It can be used down with a GFR about 25. Thiazide, HCTZ, GFR of about 40. It's cheap, but it doesn't last a full 24 hours. So here's why we get them to take their blood pressure at night. If you start someone on hydrochlorothiazide and they take it at 9 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, when they see you at 11 to 3 in the afternoon, they appear controlled. But at bedtime, their blood pressure is no longer controlled because that HCTZ doesn't last 24 hours. So that's why we love the bedtime um, measurement. Why do we love the early morning measurement? Because we want to know if they were controlled overnight before they take their first medicine in the morning. So that's why we like it when they just get out of bed. So that's why we do it when they get out of bed and before they go to bed. And people can take their medicine after they've taken their blood pressure and they can take it right before they get into bed, okay? So that's important. But for calcium blockers, we love the dihydropyridines. Amlodipine is a favorite, 2.5, five or 10. If they get a little edema in their legs, an ACE or an ARB will get rid of that, not a, not a loop diuretic, okay? It's at the capillary level why that occurs. So those three classes of drugs are the first three classes, and they're cheap. Everyone could afford those, right? And then you can use combinations, for, you know, and, and I love the combinations. I love um, a trade name drug, it's generic, I don't know if you know the drug um, Lotrel. It's uh, Benazoprel and Amlodipine, an ACE inhibitor and a CCB. Dirt cheap and very evidence-based and works very nicely together. If you want to use an ARB and a CCB, they're a little more expensive, but you could use, low, low, you could use Hyzar or Lotensin uh, HCT. And that's, um, that's COZAR, uh, excuse me, COZAR, uh, Losartan with hydrochlorothiazide. After those three drugs, if they're not controlled, make sure they're adherent. They're probably not taking their medicine. I could go into a lot more. I've talked a lot. So questions, comments, concerns, what I've said so far. I do have a question, actually. What do you think is one of the, you mentioned kind of alcohol, you know, people saying like, oh, it's cardioprotective, and so they start drinking more. What's one of the other things you find most, one of the most other, one of the most common misunderstandings in the general public 
that you see about hypertension? Oh, um, you can make it louder. Yeah. You can hear me well. I can hear you well. Uh, sorry. So you were talking about. I heard you. I heard you. I heard you. You were good. And thank you for coming up. Uh, you can hang out there if you want or go back. Uh, the misperceptions are legendary and there are so many. Um, people need to read labels. They need to look at their soup. They need to look at their. Um, I'll give you an example. If you're on a flight and you want to have a Bloody Mary, Mr. and Mrs. T in a little seven ounce can has 1,440 milligrams of sodium. When we're trying to get you to have no more than two to two and a half grams of sodium a day, right? Sodium chloride, but five grams of sodium chloride and two grams of sodium. So that's 1,440, a can of soup. Just look at the soup, it's crazy. 780 milligrams of sodium. Frozen foods, crazy. So people need to look at the labels, especially if they're you know, not cooking with more expensive and un, you know, you know, un, unprepared foods. Um, so other misconceptions, exercise is great. Walking, running, swimming, bicycling. I mean, you know, I don't know what people are, are thinking these days, but when they come into my office, I have expectations. I have all of my patients bring their last filled bottle of all their medicines over the counter, alternative, non-traditional. I want to see what they're taking. And it's crazy. People will pay money for vitamins and minerals, and they won't buy the prescriptions you write for them. You know, I, I, I don't always get it, but I, in your clinic, on the wall, you could have a little sign that says, you know, have you brought your home blood pressures? Another sign that says, have you brought all your medicine bottles to clinic today? They can give you a list. Anyone could write a list. It's good to have a list in case you're in a car accident and you show up in an ER and the doctor could go into the wallet and know what medicines you're on or you're allergic to. But in terms of adherence, I want to know their last filled bottle because when they come to me and they either don't bring the bottles with some excuse or they bring me a bottle from six months ago, I assume they didn't fill it. Here's the problem. Do you guys use e-scripts? Or do you write all your scripts out? This, they actually do both. We actually have um, at the Mercy Care Clinic, they write out the scripts, which by the way is incredibly painful for me to watch them write it out because nobody teaches them how to write it out. But then they also do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the problem. I've e-script one of my patients in Charleston, South Carolina to CVS. I assume they're going to go there and pick it up. They don't. They get a thing on their phone. Your prescription's ready. Seven days later, your prescription's later. By day 10, it's restocked. The pharmacy never calls me. I have no idea that they never picked it up. I assume they're taking their medicine. They're not. I love my patients, but I will tell you, Patients don't take their medicine. Sometimes they, they decide what dose they're going to take. So we've got to be more vigilant and work with our patients and get them to bring the bottles that we filled for them. At least then we have a chance of thinking they're taking their medicine. When they're not controlled, listen to this. You could do a 24-hour monitor after you gave them the medicine in the clinic that morning, you told them not to take it and you give them the medicine. Then you know they've at least swallowed the medicine and you can see what the monitor shows on the medicine. Or if you don't have 24 hour, do you have 24 hour monitoring? No, so here's what you do. It's a little laborious, but you can do it. You 
Tell them not to take their medicine that morning. Somebody administers and watches them take the medicine. And then you took their blood pressure in the clinic appropriately before they take the medicine. And then every two hours for up to eight hours, you take their blood pressure. You do your work. Somebody else is doing that. And they wait in the waiting room. And by the way, you better get someone to take them because by the end of that eight hours, they might be hypotensive because they're finally taking their medicine. So this is a what they call directly observed therapy, DOT. And it allows you to see if the medicine could be working if they were taking it. The studies have been done. About 30% of people that are challenged with that don't take their medicine. But here's the good news. And when you give them the, me the, the medicine, their blood pressure is controlled by the eight hours. But here's the good news. When they're confronted with that, they then, a month later, are taking their medicine and they're controlled. So there's so many issues, diet, weight, adherence, filling the medicine, staying on the medicine. But if you can solve all those things, your patients are gonna be controlled because the medicines work. Do you, um, the, I'm interested in what you're saying about the 24 hour um, monitoring. Does, does, do any insurances pay for us to, to get so, for a monitor? And great question. So a 24 hour monitor will cost you about $2,500. And somebody in the clinic has to be taught how to read the monitor, which can be done. It's not rocket science. You know, I once had a patient and I said that to him. I said, you know, I can't control your pressure. And this isn't rocket science. And he said to me, Dr. Basil, I worked for NASA for 40 years. Blood pressure control is rocket science. What I did was rocket science, but it's not hard. It's not as hard as blood pressure control. So um, they will reimburse you for 24-hour monitoring for white coat hypertension. They currently are not reimbursing for resistant hypertension or uncontrolled, but we're getting very close. We're gonna, we just petitioned the coding people to give us a code for white coat for resistant hypertension. Currently, there's no code. There's no ICD-10 code for uh, resistant hypertension. When they do that, I think we're going to be able to get payment for a 24-hour monitor because you need that when they're resistant. You really do. So, you know, I, I'm an advocate for 24-hour monitoring, but a lot of clinics can't afford it. I'd rather see you get the ambulatory oscillometric device with the push of a button rather than worrying about uh, inflation and deflation and, and all that stuff and hearing, yeah. By the way, if they have AFib, you have to use a sigma manometer. But all other rhythms, you can use an automatic, automated oscillometric device. I wonder if the students have any questions yeah. or any cases that you'd like to talk about. Yeah. I have a quick question for you. What does your discussion look like with the patient? A lot of the patients here are it feels like sometimes they're just stubborn. Like if you sort of go about this discussion of, because they'll come in and they'll say, oh, I didn't like the side effect, I stopped my medication. Or I didn't like this, I'm taking half the dose. And it feels like if you counter that strongly with why aren't you taking your prescribed dose, then they will just do what they want to and not tell you. Um, and same thing for a lot of aspects of care. So I'm just wondering, how do you how do you approach that conversation of sort of, meeting patients in the middle, because a lot of them also would prefer lifestyle changes over medication. Like that seems to be a big theme in this communicate community is not wanting to add on multiple medications. So sort of how do you approach that conversation? Okay. And how control is better than no control. That's a great, great question. So we only recommend using pharmacologic drug therapy 
in low risk people, and I don't know if you're using the pool cohort equation. Do you have a computer system there that you use? We and use which one do you use? For our EMR? Yeah. Yeah, we use eClinical Exchange. What is it? eClinical Exchange. Okay, I don't know that. But we use Epic. What do you all use, do you know? Um, uh, Citrix. Oh, okay. Yeah. We use Epic, and in Epic, they calculate the 10-year risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is important for determining if a patient should be on a statin for their lipids, if they should be on aspirin if they're 40 to 59 years of age as primary prevention, and if they should be on an antihypertensive for drug therapy if they don't have chronic kidney disease, atherosclerotic disease, and their risk is for diabetes. And the risk has to be 10% or more if their blood pressure is less than 140, but greater than 130. So for a lot of patients, lifestyle modification is all you're going to use initially, because they're 136 over 84. I'm not going to use a drug in them if they're at low risk. So I don't want to put them on a medicine. By the way, I don't want to be quick to call them hypertensive unless I have multiple measurements in the office and out of the office that are elevated. There's no rush to put them on a medicine. Although once we determine they're hypertensive, we'd like to get them controlled within three to six months. My conversation with the patients are like this, is like this. I say to the patients, you know, you and I have to have a contract for your health. And one of the parts of the contract is I recommend things. And if you don't think they're in your best interest, you tell me that when I recommend them. So if I write a medicine for you, I'm going to assume that you're going to take the medicine as written so I can make future determinations on how you're doing based on the fact that I assume you're taking the medicine. If there's ever a reason you can't take the medicine as written, tell me so I can talk to you about it and adjust what we do next. Otherwise, I'm making assumptions on the wrong information. And I'm not going to be judgmental. If you have a side effect, call the office. I'll get back to you. And we'll discuss what the problem is so I can make a determination. Because if I'm not seeing you in a, in a month and you decide you're having a problem and you stop the medicine, that's all that time that I'm not controlling your pressure. So that's what I do with patients. And you know, you gain their trust, you, you're an advocate for the patient. And they know you want what's best for them. So I'm demanding, but at the same time, my patients know my expectations. So if they don't, if they're taking half the medicine, fine. Tell me, and let's talk about why you couldn't take the full dose. But if you can take the half dose, I'll add another medication at a lower dose. Because two medicines at the initial dose gives you much more blood pressure reduction than the full dose of one. Let me make it simple. Lisinopril HCTZ at 20, 12.5 will give you much more blood pressure reduction than 25 of HCTZ or 40 of lisinopril. That's one of the reasons we like combinations. They're better adhered to, there are fewer side effects, and there's more blood pressure reduction than maximizing the first drug. Now, I may go back and then take that 2012.5 and end up on 4025. But I didn't maximize the HCTZ first and then add the lisinopril. So that's how I handle that kind of conversation. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah. I mean, you know. Nobody leaves my office thinking 
I'm not interested in their health. The rest is up to them. And sometimes I will ask them to bring their spouse, loved one, or whomever, children, if I'm not making any progress. And we'll have a very open discussion. And a lot of times, children will say to me, don't worry, Dr. Basil, I'll make sure that dad takes their medicine. I'll make sure mom takes their medicine. And we'll get a pill cut, you know, a weekly pill dispenser, and we'll, we'll work on that. I have a question. So a lot of the patients we have here are uh, very elderly. And so a big concern with, with blood pressure and blood pressure medication is orthostatic hypotension. So I'm wondering, I guess, how that age uh, impacts uh, hypertension management. Okay. The patient's frailty, their cognition, their ability to ambulate, their quality of life, all of those things have to be taken into account. But 90 is yesterday's 70, and 70 is yesterday's 50. I don't know what percent of people in your practice are smoking, but across the United States, smoking is only done by 14% of adult Americans. When I went to medical school in Richmond, Virginia, where cigarettes were made, the adult American was about 34% smokers, one out of three. Now it's one out of seven. That's phenomenal. So when, when we say someone's elderly, we have to be careful because I know 90-year-olds that jump up on the table, and I know 50-year-olds that look like they're and act like they're 80, okay? Because I want to get people's blood pressure close to 130, regardless of age. But I won't do it if they're frail. I won't do it if they're hypotensive and orthostatic hypotension from a seated position, taking their pressure. You now, now get them to stand for one to three minutes, and I usually do one and then retake their pressure, their systolic doesn't drop 20, and their pulse doesn't go up 10. Orthostatic hypotension is uncommon today. It's not common. You know, so... Uh, That's because they're all in Payson. What's that? <laughs> they're all in Payson. Here. They're all there, all <laughs> orthostatic? <laughs> well... <laughs> You know, people, you know, you've got to be careful with why that's occurred. There are certain drug classes that can do it, like alpha blockers. They're associated with orthostatic hypertension. But most of the antihypertensives we use are not really particularly associated with orthostatic hypertension. People that are orthostatic need sodium, need volume. You know, you need to look at all their medicines. Um, so that's not a great problem in my, in my practice. And let me tell you, I've taken care of tens of thousands of patients in my day in blood pressure. So I don't have a real strong sense that patients are walking around with orthostatic hypotension. Now, do you have dizziness? Do you fall? What's their gait? You can watch them walk. Someone that comes in a wheelchair, or with a walker or a cane, hey, I'm very concerned. And I'm not gonna be as aggressive with their blood pressure. So I'm gonna evaluate the whole patient. Um, so that's how I handle that. Thank you. Yeah. So we got a couple minutes left. Any other closing questions or comments? I guess just since you mentioned it, what are your thoughts on aspirin as primary prophylaxis for like cardiovascular events given the like recent USPSTF kind of guidelines and change? My feeling is 
that if I have a patient that's been taking aspirin as a primary prevention, and they're not 40 to 59, but they've had no bleeding, and they're not at high risk for bleeding, I do not stop their aspirin. However, I only start aspirin as a primary preventive in people that are at higher risk for an event, and I use that pooled cohort equation, 10% or more, who are 40 to 59 and a low risk for bleeding. So I am not as often using aspirin as a primary preventive in patients not on aspirin, but I still continue the aspirin in patients that have had no bleeding and have been using it as a primary preventive. Now, secondary prevention, no question. 81 to 325 milligrams of aspirin. We don't know the best dose. A baby aspirin is probably fine. If they've had an MI, especially within the first several years, if we know they have atherosclerotic disease in their carotid, in their, in their cardiovascular, in their peripheral vascular, I would use a baby aspirin at, to prevent a recurrent event when they've had an event. So just knowing that they have a high coronary calcium score, I'm not going to ne necessarily use aspirin. But if they've had an MI, or they've had a bypass, or they have a, a fem pop, pop bypass, or, or a stent in their lower leg, you know, I'm going to use aspirin, secondary prevention, very evidence-based. Thank you so much. Dr. Hunt and everyone there, I, you know, it's so impressive to see you guys there, and I really uh, appreciated you connecting with us tonight, and uh, I wish I could see your faces close up. Um, but it's, I've really enjoyed this. And, and Dr. And thank you, Dr. Basil. You're really welcome. Been great. My pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Have a good night. Okay. Yeah. Take care, Bye. guys.